Okay, so learning objectives for this presentation. We're gonna to try to understand um, and identify what the general vulnerabilities of rock foundations are for embankment dams, concrete structures, including spillways. Um, those are sort of like the, the failure mode mechanisms that rock poses uh, for certain projects. And then we're gonna to try to understand how the vulnerabilities, the PFMs fit into and how we communicate it in a risk characterization framework. Um, we need to understand the types of structures that are founded on rock and how the conditions in the rock mass or in the foundation affect the structure's performance over time, things to look for and document, and then um, describe the information needed to better understand the vulnerabilities. Okay, the outline for this presentation, uh, we'll cover internal erosion for embankment dams, so embankments sitting on rock. So what are the failure modes associated with that? Usually it's discontinuities, rock mass structure, uh, maybe low stress zones, that sort of thing, or dissolution and that sort of thing. Uh, Manel covered quite a bit of the cracking and the internal erosion components. So I'm gonna skip some of those when we get to them. Um, then we're gonna talk about concrete structures sitting on rock foundations. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little historical perspective, some background on case histories just a brief overview of some of the key ones that kind of influence the various failure modes for rock or concrete structures. Um, talk about failure modes again, foundation considerations and how we put that into a risk framework. Uh, we're gonna talk about spillway uh, failure, rock scour and spillway erosion, concrete lined, because of the, there's been an emphasis since Oroville in 2017 to really focus on spillway structures and, and they're kind of interesting new realm, not new realm, but they're getting a lot more attention is what I would say. And then we'll summarize with some key takeaways at the end. So internal erosion. So these are a couple just case histories of internal erosion where water pressures and water flows through the embankment structure are able to move part particles of the embankment into the rock mass or through the rock mass. So we have Fontenelle Dam, Teton, Wolf Creek, East Branch, and Mosul are the ones I, key ones I listed here. Uh, yeah, Manel talked a little bit about those, those. Teton obviously was the only one that technically failed, but this is a picture of significant car systems that developed in Wolf Creek and has been <laughs> an ongoing effort to treat and mitigate those. I know TVA has a lot of really complicated um, karst projects that are going on. And then Fontenelle had some erosion issues in the abutment as well. Mosul's a really interesting case history. Some days you should see some of those presentations that are in AEG um, by, by some others. Georgette and some others, and it's fascinating what was going on at Mosul. Okay, so a typical event tree for a erosion into a foundation is we have the open rock, open flaw in the foundation, maybe some ineffective treatment or ineffective um, foundation management or foundation shaping, uh, initiation, so we have to have some loading, we have to be able to move particles into the rock mass. Rock mass has to be big enough to accommodate the movement of of particles or and we probably need some sort of exit or place for it to go. Continuation, progression, clogging. So the event tree helps us, one, get to a place where we can estimate the, the likelihood of these events all happening in sequence because you don't just have erosion doesn't just cause a problem. You have to have a sequence of events, sequence of of things that happen so that you can kind of find your place on the FN chart. But it also helps us understand where the geologic, geotechnical, hydrogeologic components of the foundation and the rock influence the most the, um, the event tree. So if we look at the open rocks, here we can, we can help by field investigations going out and understanding what the joint network is, what's the frequency, what's the openness of the joints. We can understand and evaluate if the foundation treatment was effective. We can read the documents. We can look at construction photos. We can look at piezometers, perhaps, and that sort of thing and see if the foundation treatment is showing pressures in the foundation, for example. Um, and then on the initiation, maybe we can obtain information to understand gradients across the core and the core trench. So these are the things that we need to look at or understand to 
either do the site characterization or understand these parts of the failure mode before we even go into the risk assessment. And then we can focus on what to look for in the, in the documents or in the field. This is just an example of the write-up for the PFM. I'm not going to read through it, but it has to be very clear. It has to be somewhat specific and relate to that event tree so that it all flows together. Uh, low stress zones. So real quick, because I know we kind of covered some of these, but in a rock foundation, we might have unfavorable foundation and abutment slope geometry, really steep slopes, breaks in slopes, uh, foundation rock irregularities like this, large steps in the foundation. So if you're looking at construction photos and you see really steep faces and ledges and breaks in the slope, um, usually it's somewhere on the order of 60, 60, 55, 60 degrees. If they're steeper than that, you can get low stress and cracking across those, those features. And you can get low tension that can be high, exploited with hydrofracture, you know, just erosion along the, the foundation. Um, you can have high potentiometric surfaces along a fault feature, a crack that are transferred from the, from the dam. Uplift pressures, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, structural considerations. Uh, embedded structures, obviously conduits, concrete structures. This is some of the stuff that uh, Manel was talking about, compaction history, construction history, stresses, settlement, that sort of thing. So going into a risk assessment, and we kind of have uh, understanding at the beginning that we might have rock-related um, foundation conditions that could facilitate internal erosion to some degree. We obviously need to go back through all of our data. We need to do all this review ahead of the risk assessment. We need to understand the layout, the maps, construction photos. Um, look at the photos from the geologic, geopentical perspective. Do you have breaks? Do you have open cracks? Does it look like it was treated well? Uh, what's the subsurface data look like? Look at aerial imagery, all the instrumentation. All that needs to be compiled, synthesized, so you have your geologic model in your head of how that failure mode is influenced by those features. And then this is the information. A history or emplacement setting, rock structure, um, the geologic history, orientation, distribution, characteristics of the discontinuities, faults, features, faults, shears, fractures, contacts, old erosional surfaces, those sorts of things. Uh, continuity at the scale of the failure mode. So we always say continuity, but you know, then there's there's definitely ranges of, well, it's con continuous if it's a hundred feet or more and those sorts of things. But it's really at the at the scale of the failure mode, right? Maybe you only need the failure the the feature to be a couple tens of feet wide for it to accept material and start a piping issue. Uh, um, Potentiometric service, exit conditions, those sorts of things. So, uh, okay, quick, oh, excuse me, knowledge check. Okay, so the questions here are, given what you can see in this quick little screenshot of some, some sections, cross section, geologic section, some, some construction photos, what are the potential issues with the foundation? And then what information would you look for in the documentation or in available data or in the field during a drill program to to characterize the risk of this, um, this abutment. I don't know if anyone wants to go for it. Yep, very steep slope right here up against the spillway. This section is kind of running along the center line. So you can see the spillway here in this section. You have sandstone, massive and blocky. Looks like there's some fracturing right there in that upper high part of the abutment. Varved shales, varved clay type material. And then here's the um, grout curtain. Um, so what, what sort of things would else, else would concern you in this? Yes, please. Foundation frequent, like grouting and those cracks that do weigh um, vertical cracks. Right. Did they get it all? Did they fill it all with grout? And did the grout perform over time? And um, yeah, that's, that's a good one. So so these, these are sort of the answers I came up with. You'll see you'll, you're right here, right? We have potential for bedding plane and near vertical joint systems. In this case, we had uh, stress relief joints. Stress relief joints are due to the valley down cutting and the rock, rock relaxing into that free surface. And those joint sets form 
pretty much perpendicular to the embankment and they can, they can have a lot of tension on them just because of how the slope is formed and the stresses develop. So we can have deep open joints that are perpendicular to the dam axis. And this is Fontenelle, so that's exactly what happened. So in this abutment, they had open joints, water was moving through there, it started moving the materials, right, from the embankment through that, and it was almost, um, almost a bad Teton-like failure, but it, they lowered the reservoir soon enough. Um, and then this would be some of the information you might need. Characteristics, uh, extents, shape, geometry. There's your grout methods. Did they grout it? Did they get it? Grouting is hard to uh, determine sometimes if you don't have a lot of before and after type information. Okay, uh, go into the historical perspective for concrete structures um, and their failure modes and incidences. This is following an I cold summary. And we see that the foundation represents almost 53% of all the structural failures or incidences that, that concrete dams have had. And that's related to all kinds of things, failure, sliding, movement, erosion, all those sort of things. But we also have other things here that are like overtopping, overtopping of a concrete dam that's probably related to erosion at the toe from plunging or flowing water that it was not designed for. Uh, uplift is another failure mechanism. So uplift is also related to the foundation and water being able to move and pressures being transmitted through the foundation to cause you know, um, adverse pressures in a, in a concrete structure. And then um, here is another one, a spillway. So all these highlighted ones probably relate in some way back to the foundation and the geologic, geotechnical conditions that exist in those, those scenarios. All right, so a couple notable foundation failures. I would say it's really nice to go back. You can research this pretty easy. I know the Corps and Bureau all have a lot of this information, and so does um, um, ASDSO has all these things on their dam failures website. It's a really good resource. But if you understand the failures of the past, maybe we can understand going into risk assessment what the issues might be in our site, you know, compare the compare the conditions between your site and these. So Bayless, oh, that's the wrong one. That's actually Austin Dam. Shoot, I screwed up. All right, this is actually Austin Dam. This is outside of Austin, Texas. It, and it overtopped and it eroded into the foundation on one side where there was a fault. And when it eroded, it eroded back and they didn't have the capacity to withstand about you know a third of the erosion at the toe and it started overturned and it slid. Uh, these are reversed. So this one's Bayless Dam, which is in Pennsylvania. That slid on a shallow shale layer that um, was not intersected by the foundation. And um, there was some other things as well because the, the owner of this structure pushed for dam height increases without a width increase. There was a lot of issues. I mean, there, the, a lot of issues with how that was built and the structural engineering, and they didn't go back and redo the analysis to some degree. And um, sure enough, it ended up in failure and a lot of, lot of life loss. Their label is right on this. The St. Francis Dam, this one's in California. I think there were 700 and something people killed by this failure. It was catastrophic. They had an abutment, basically a landslide. It was not a pre-existing landslide. It was a landslide that formed because of high water pressures, but it followed a systematic pattern in the region of landsliding along, um, along a foliation plane. So in theory, they might have seen that there, all these failures or all these landslides existed along this foliation plane. They might have seen that same foliation plane here and maybe have done something different. It also, none of these have drains in them, I would say, <laughs> is one common common factor between a lot of the failures of concrete structures. They don't have, they didn't, they weren't built with drains. Malpasse is in France, and this was a key block failure. So there was a adversely oriented rock wedges in the abutment of an arch dam. And when the, during first loading, the, the pressures got into the rock block and actually shifted and lifted it along with the dam arching stresses, and it pushed the rock wedge up and out of its socket. And then Camara is a RCC dam in Brazil, and in 2004 it eroded because um, 
it had like adverse out of out of slope shear planes uh, in the in the abutment that the that when the water pressures got into the abutment foundation, it washed material into the drains. So actually, this one did have drains, but they ended up being partially related to the the location where the material could be washed. So it was coming up out of the drains. Material was, and finally, it opened up a large area, and the the abutment rock kind of slid and collapsed down, took out the dam, big chunk of it. But it ended up spanning that. It's kind of interesting. All right, failure modes for concrete structures. We have uh, stability and sliding along weak planes in the foundation, horizontal bedding planes or shale planes, clay seams in the foundation that uh, can act as a sliding block a lot of times. This is a problem or a consideration that we have in a lot of core dams because we have a lot of flat line, uh, flat line bedrock in a lot of our concrete structures, spillway structures, dams in in the mid you know kind of Midwest area where there's a lot of flat line weak rock. Um, again, this is the malpasate failure wedge formed by multiple adverse oriented discontinuities and it can dislodge from an abutment under under adverse loading. Um, we can also fail, your, fail through the rock mass itself, so you don't necessarily need the adverse blocks or planes. You can just put enough load into something to, to distress the rock mass. Um, a lot of times, too, we can have irregular or differential deformation in the foundation. So we can have erosion, uh, seismic loading can differentially apply load into the foundation, and if, if the rock mass has different modulus, that structure might behave not as intended, and stresses can get concentrated in the concrete structure that can cause cracking or, or other adverse deformations. Then um, solution features or soluble material in the rock, loss of bearing, you can have scour and undermining. So these are some of the typical failure modes that you would want to kind of consider when, when we're looking at a concrete structure, whether it's spillway um, control structure or the dam itself. I mentioned uplift. Uplift pressures are really difficult to evaluate. Um, there's a lot of rules of thumb. You know, if you have grout curtain and you have a, a row of drains, you can take some um, rule of thumb type reductions that those are providing an uplift reduction, but, but you really don't know unless you have instrumentation upstream and downstream of those drains and the grout curtain system. It's hard to have reliability. So you end up with maybe um, making estimates of theoretical uplift or um, maybe you're taking that reduction at the drains if you know they're working, you have, can read them. But estimating uplift across an entire couple thousand foot long foundation with just a couple sensors in certain areas is difficult in rock because it could be one discontinuity, you know, something like 90% of all the flows goes through 10% of the rock mass. So are your sensors sitting on a shale and they're measuring zero uplift because the shale is kind of keeping the uplift pressures from getting to that sensor? So there's a lot of considerations in the risk assessment when you're talking about the uplift because the uplift totally dictates, you know, the stability of the structure. Plugged drains are also another issue as well. If there's a good maintenance program for the drain systems, they've cleaned them, they've flushed them, they've scoured them, and made sure that they're operating well is a, is a good uh, tool for you to increase your, or decrease your uncertainty. Because otherwise, you know, you can get biofouling, calcium carbonate, and magnesium, and iron oxide will plug up the drain system, plug up the cracks to the fractures in the rock and keep them from, from operating as intended. Uh, landslides, Manel did mention this, but you can have slides that are into the reservoir, slides that actually impact the structures themselves, right? They, they tow out in the foundation, they shift and move the structure. Um, landslides into the reservoir can create siege waves. This is a classic Viant. Uh, case history, which is also pretty fascinating to, to learn and understand. These can occur upstream or downstream at the dam and cause other impacts, right? Maybe you have a landslide, which occurs during high rainfalls, which is when emergency operations or, or attention at the dam might be necessary, but then you have a landslide downstream and you can't access the facility or it takes out communication lines. 
Um, and that can impact how the dam's operated. Sometimes it's a remotely operated structure, and if you take out the infrastructure to either get there or to communicate with the, with the systems, you can have a problem. Um, when you're doing site characterization, I would say for landsliding, you know, you have to have certain conditions. You have to have certain slopes. You have to have certain adverse kind of geologic environments that facilitate landslides. And um, if this is a failure mode that you're considering, look regionally at what trigger, what landslides um, mechanisms, failure mechanisms exist beyond just the dam, beyond just the reservoir. Because then if you understand that slides are occurring somewhere else, does that geologic setting sort of communicate or translate into your, your project setting? Uh, these are non-geotech type failure modes you would al also be considering in a risk assessment. Gate failure and trunnion friction. Trunnions are the pins that, it's, that it rotates on. Those get blocked, locked up and those, those can shear and fail. That's what happened at Folsom. Uh, internal structural failure, so failure actually through the through the concrete at lift lines or at areas of different rebar installations. That's Wanapum. That happened just about a decade ago. Uh, ASR is one too. And site characterization does help with alkali silica re reaction if you know where the aggregates came from and you know what their source material are and if they contain what's called amorphous, like non-crystallized silica, it can react with the with the hydroxide ions in the concrete and it forms a gel and expands, contracts, cause, causes damage in the concrete. Seismic failures, um, I don't go into it more than this slide. Um, of course, rupture through a structure is, is catastrophic. It could, can be catastrophic. Um, it's never happened. So for, for most part, in all the data that we have and all the information we have, concrete structures behave really well in seismic environments. There's a lot of times there's damage in cosmetic type damage, right? It'll spall, it'll break parapet walls, it'll break internal structures. So there's probably L&M issues, but so far a, a dam hasn't catastrophically failed because of earthquake loading. So that's something we can take into a risk assessment too, have some, some confidence that concrete structures do behave well. This is a uh, Shikian Dam in Taiwan, and this had what was called co-seismic failure. So it's not like on the main fault, but there was some deformation that occurred away from, away from the fault in the abutment, and it lifted, it lifted part of the dam up. And luckily there was nobody, no, it didn't fully breach the reservoir and the reservoir was low at that time, but that's an interesting case study. Um, I'm not gonna go and read into all this, but there's been a lot of studies and work done by Dick Goodman and Bureau Rec where they did physical models on trying to understand what the roughness and three-dimensionality of a concrete structure is in terms of sliding. So if you have an undulating, irregular foundation surface or, or bedding surface or failure surface that you're moving on, and you have adjacent competent, not moving failure monoliths, you can generate a lot of three-dimensional resistance in a, a, a one or two monoliths that need to slide out. There's some other criteria to here, you know, what's the length versus the, uh, fail, the failure surface. And if it's too long, it might open more like a trap door rather than a couple monoliths sliding out. So in the risk assessment, bringing in the three-dimensionality of the system and talking about that with the, the potential for failure in a monolith is, is important. So those are the considerations that Goodman and others developed related to foundations and rock. Um, this is really a repeat of the data and information that was needed for any structure. Um, Manel discussed these things too. This is a good list can reference it when it's time. Okay, so now we're gonna get into uh, rock scour and overtopping. Again, this is all, the, the reason we're looking at lost spillways nowadays, and, and the core is just, I don't know how long it took us. It took us a couple years. Actually, Jamie's the guy I talked about. He built this system. But we've been looking at this screening tool where we've looked at 160 ish, 160 concrete lined 
spillways within our whole inventory. And, and Jamie built this cool tool where we went through and ranked all these different components of them and started then to filter through which ones are high vulnerability, which ones are were low vulnerability. And it's been a really interesting process. And we've learned a lot about our structures doing that. Um, but all of it is kind of precipitated by the Oroville fil failure that occurred in 2017. Um, little summary on that, right? There's a couple of factors. How did this shear? It has really competent rock in the Oroville Foundation. It's a, a Precambrian type, maybe it's not Precambrian, but it's really hard, strong um, greenstone type metamorphic rock, but it has all these shears and failures in it. That, that's that oxidized reddish zone that you can see in some of the photos. And um, that, all the, all the rock had the exact same depths of rock anchors, right? So they only went five feet into that rock. It should have gone five feet into more into the competent rock. So all of the anchoring through that shear zone probably should have been two, three times deeper. The other thing was that they put the, the drains, the drains, instead of them being down in a trench, they were inset up into the, into the concrete. So it created much thinner concrete over all the drains. So the, the, the slabs all cracked and they had lots of infiltration over time. That's the one thing that uh, talk about with spillways is that it's not always the mega flood or the past history that can tell you how it's gonna behave under even lower flow events or the next time because of temporal effects, weathering, freeze thaw, all those sort of things. Okay, so erosion scour. This means that we remove rock and pluck rock and rock blocks from the foundation or the abutment. And it can happen when there's an overtopping event and it flanks around. So this is Gibson Dam, the whole thing overtopped. You get plunging jets on the abutments all the way down into the, into the valley. So you might have to assess the rock mass erodibility resistance up and down the whole abutment and then figure out how, how deep and how big it might be. We can have under seepage through the foundation that starts to move materials. It's kind of an internal erosion failure mode, but instead of piping in the, the embankment materials, we're actually just creating a void. Can the structure span the void that, that might be eroded? Um, is it full breach of the reservoir if that is large enough and it can extend back under the whole structure? Um, then we have the spillway failure modes where we can get headward erosion from the spillway at the end or along the sidewalls. This is one thing I think that I learned a lot about during our spillway review was if, the, if you can overtop into the, into the wing walls of a spillway chute structure, those are often backfilled with soil, almost always. So you don't really pour those things against necessarily a resistant material. So as soon as you start getting turbulence and eddies and agitation, you can move that side soil out and you can start eroding on the back side of those walls. And I think that actually did happen at Orville as well, to some degree. Uh, backward erosion, a weak foundation from the, from the bottom. Um, this is another one to think about. If you have a hydropower facility and you have the abutment um, uh, penstocks, those abutment penstocks can leak. They can transfer pressures outward. And if they're not confined or they're not buried deep enough, you can blow out material um, on the abutment slope and around, the, around in a, a structure's foundation. All right, scour initiates when we have either high velocity and or increased depths. It's not always one or the other, right? These things just affect the stream power and the shear stress at the base. So thicker flow and uh, higher moving water. And we increase the shear stress and we have turbulence that's generated and it causes particle detachment. That's my angry water uh, icon. And that came from, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> think about this. That, that came from our bluestone discussions. So um, yeah, the angry water shows up because that's, that's where erosion happens. When you get angry, bad water. I'm not a hydraulics person, so that's pretty much as much I know about hydraulics. It's either angry or not. Uh, so adverse surface features. So these are, these are the, the flow surface is going over the dam. It's going over uh, different surfaces, going around things, and you create this hydraulic jump. And it goes from laminar to turbulent where you can start to pluck particles, soil, rock, 
whatever. And all these can be in breaks and slope, uh, obstacles, trees, boulders, vegetation, guardrails, K-rails. So you got to look for all these things on your embankment for overtopping erosion, but also in the spillway, where's it drop, where's it move? Think about how the water is going to move through that slot and over that surface. Uh, contrast and cover is another big one, right? You're going from the line spillway into a rough channel. That's where a jump may occur, or that's where the agitation of the water might happen. Bare spots, settlement, low, low, low spots like around a utility trench, um, and cracking in asphalt, we can get water in and under that thing. This is sort of the general kind of perspective on scour mechanics. This is the plunging, this is by Pope Bollert, and he, he, he studied mostly plunging jets, but it's sort of, this mechanics is basically the same, whether you have um, a, a roller, back roller, or a plunging structure where you get energy being imparted into some sort of tail water, perhaps, and you get um, dissipation of energy with depth. So sometimes tail, if you get tail water up on a structure, it helps reduce um, reduce the erosion potential sometimes. But you also get this pool and you get backward erosion, you get eddies forming. So you have an impinging or a jet that hits the rock, increase in surface stress, increase in, um, in this fracture potential where you have fluctuating surges of energy that go into a rock or rock mass. Submerged tailwater uh, starts to agitate and move around. You get blocks too, right? Rock that gets shifted around, like a, a boulder or something gets shifted around in a scour hole and it starts knocking features off. So you get abrasion from, from those things. And then, uh, then we get particle detachments. So the rock is formed by discontinuities or the soil by particles and you start being able to detach those. So we need to know something about what this detachment capacity is. What's the rock mass ability to resist this particle detachment? And then we get removal and transport, and that's what uh, causes scour. This one probably should have been first because it basically says we have to have some capacity of water. We have to, have, we have to know something about the rock mass uh, resistance to erosion. And these two are kind of related. So the rock mass has a resistance inherent in itself, but you also might have discontinuities that are adversely oriented. There's certain orientation of a discontinuity that is favorable or unfavorable to the direction of water flow and to the energy of water flow. So we have to pull all those things together. These are the general rock scour uh, mechanics. Bullard did mostly a physics-based model on how blocks and fractures propagate and how you can lift and transport block given certain hydraulics. That's just more of a concept on how detachment works. Uh, George Annandale is probably the most kind of referenced methodology to assess the rock mass resistance to erosion. And he did it by calibrating about 150, 160 field and lab studies where they had known erosion, known stream powers, or they could back calculate the stream powers. And they could estimate what they call the rock erodibility index and compare that with this weird unit, stream power is kilowatts per meter squared of energy dissipated over a surface. So it's taken me time to, to wrap my head around what that looks like and what it means. Um, anecdotally, I don't think we have a good handle on that part of it. That's my, that's my perception is that we can calculate it using Annandale's method. We can plot it on the chart, but it's, this is a tricky one to, calculate. It's, it's an idealistic calculation. Um, and usually it's a 2D calculation too. So we're, we're kind of stuck with that. Mike George built on Annadale's um, concepts and he brought in block theory. So that's like removability. And, and then Pels. Pels is, uh, I would say, somewhat newer. I think 2016 or so. He started doing something similar to George Annandale, but he's comparing it to a different rock mass classification system to show you right now. We use, pretty much right now, we use the Annandale method. That is our risk assessment toolbox that we, that we have used for years, but we are also trying to now balance that with using other methodologies. So Annandale. Annandale took what was called Kirsten's Ripability Index. So that's like, if you have a D8, dozer with a single shank on it, 
what's the rock mass condition that allows you to rip that or not rip it, right, where it can't get through the rock mass. So that's where it kind of started, and that had to do with the rock mass and the joint. The rock mass is sort of the strength plus the, and the fracture resistance. And then Annandale, he added on Barton's rock Q rock mass classification system, which was developed for tunneling, right? So Barton and others did a lot of their rock mass classification system, watching how tunnels converge, where they failed, where they didn't, and then they put their rock mass systems together. So we have tunneling, rock mass, and ripability kind of combining to give us something related to erosion. So there may be some interesting components on that. How, how important is US, the unconfined strength? of an intact piece that gets dislodged along a discontinuity. Um, and then estimating these, uh, we do from photos, we do from rock core logs, we do from reading reports, and we can get to this rock mass assessment. That's then plotted against this stream power calc that you have to evaluate. So what we have here is like a kind of slab control structure with some cutoff walls, and we have a nick point downstream so what happens when we get all these different flows up above and we have a, a profile that looks like this. We have soil, weathered rock, and unweathered material. So the first thing we get is like a plunge pool type formation down at the nick point once it starts to find, find a, a way to start removing material. And you have a certain calculation that's associated with that to get the stream power of the back roller and the energy in that system. Then along the slope, you have a different calculation that's really related to the gradient and the you know, density of water, flow of water. But then once that erosion gets back up to the sill, we might have a, a plunging type scenario if the flows are, are, are sufficient to create the plunge. Maybe they're not. So we have a whole bunch of different ways to calculate stream power to then compare to the rotability index and all of them are really a 2D scenario. So, got to keep all those things in mind. This is the Annandale uh, plot. You're probably familiar with this. You plot the stream power and the uh, erodibility, and you can kind of find your zone and have confidence band on wh what the erodibility is. This is quick PELS. PELS is a little different. It basically plots the same thing, plots um, stream power, but it's against um, the geologic strength index, which is a different rock mass system, and it has benefits and drawbacks. All right, so spillway risk assessments, um, we, we hadn't focused on them that significantly till Oroville, mostly because a lot of times a spillway failure will have a lot slower development time. Therefore, you have increased warning, and you can react a little faster. A lot of times there's this potential for intervention. You can draw a reservoir down, divert water, use sandbags, uh, jersey barriers dropped from helicopters, <laughs> stuff like that. And then a lot of times the spillway may only release the upper portion of the pool, not, not, not the entire, for Oroville, 760 feet, but maybe it's the upper 30, 40 feet. So there's different consequences associated with spillways. And so the attention on them had been less less significant because, at least for the core, they didn't represent a lot of life loss, really. We could react to them, we could give warning, but because of Oroville, we're now focusing on these and we're thinking about it a little differently because spillways need to operate. We have public perception issues. Um, if a spillway does fail, you, fit, Oroville didn't technically fail either, right? It just didn't do what it's supposed to do, <laughs> but it didn't fail the, the dam. But it's a really poor, look, right? It was dramatic. It was on all the national television. There's huge repair costs, billion dollars for Oroville. Operational cost issues and that sort of thing. Maybe you have pool restrictions. So failure, failures may occur at flows lower than previously experienced or, or than design. So you can have spillway design for 100,000 CFS, yet Half that might cause the failure because of certain temporal conditions that occur over time. We're going to talk about that real quick. And they're expected to operate and function as intended during extreme events. All right, so we're going to cruise through an event tree. This is, I'm going to give credit to Mike George. He created this. But, um, so you get some sort of loading on the spillway structure that's flowing down the, the lined or unlined um, channel. 
and you start to get a nick point, right? You get a little bit of a nick point, start plucking materials, you start creating a scour hole, the nick point or the, the plunge captures more water, gets deeper, gets more turbulence, gets more angry water down inside there. Maybe it's a shear zone, maybe it's fault, maybe it's weak soil or rock. And then that progresses upstream. It keeps taking more water, keeps enlarging in depth, enlarging in size. And it's following something, right? It's following weak rock to canny road. So that's the three dimensionality of the system. If it's a shear zone that has an orientation that's offset from this, it might not migrate directly to the structure. So you gotta keep in mind those, those features. But ultimately what this, the, the failure mode is, is we get to a point where we fail the structure. Either you undermine the structure itself or you can undermine the rock and the rock fails into that. And the goal of the risk assessment for a spillway is to then take all those failure modes, all those steps, I mean, all those nodes of sequence and how you get to this case and try to put these numbers on it, right? These probabilities onto it. And that's, that's a tricky thing. It takes, takes work with all your other colleagues and, and somebody understands that. So concrete line spillways, uh, these are just a photo of all the defensive measures you look for. You want to look for key walls and sills. These are, these are extremely helpful as long as they're deep enough. If they're not deep enough, you can undermine the sill, then uh, you got a problem. But if they're deep enough, these would maybe re you know, resist the head cut. We have usually concrete slabs. In theory, they're, they've got rebar in them, maybe two layers of rebar. They maybe are connected across joints. They have water stops in them. They have all these defensive measures and features. We have pipes and drains that are inset down and away and sized right and not plugged. We have anchors that are, have deep embedment enough to have the capacity to resist the uplift forces that are generated. We have some maybe drain holes to keep the water pressures from being fully realized under the foundation. So those are the defensive measures you would want to try to look for. Stagnation pressure, this is another, like, <laughs> we all have to work in, in risk. You have to work in this cross multidisciplinary world. So as an engineering geologist, I've learned a lot about structural engineering, learned a lot about hydraulics and that sort of thing. And all this stuff comes together, it really helps. The more you learn, the better. So stagnation pressures develop when you have offsets in the slabs. These are the considerations going into a foundation spillway risk assessment. These are probably some of the considerations you would want to think about. Some of them I mentioned already. So I'm going to zing right past that one. Three-dimensionality of erodibility of the rock. How deep is it? If we have a weathered zone that progressively gets better, a lot of rock, right? You drill it, you get crummy rock, and then you get fractured and weathered rock, that has some depth and space to it. A shear zone might be the same erodibility all the way through its entire existence to, to, to its base. So think about the three-dimensionality of the rock and erodibility system. Think about the duration and time of the hydrograph. When can you start? What's the stream power at an initiation location? What's the stream power at... Um, the migration, so the temporal effects of a spillway failure mode and progression are really, really hard. There's no, there's no tool. We don't have a tool now. We don't have a model that models the duration of the head cut under a slab in a certain rock mass. So you got to put your erodibility per perception onto the hydrograph, figure out where you are. Maybe you run out of water <laughs> in, the, in the risk assessment. Or maybe you're like Garrison and it flows for like three months. So these are the key factors. Hydraulics and geology of spillway foundation. These two things are integral. If you're the geologist or the hyd hydraulics person, you, you should understand the mechanics of the other disciplines so you can communicate, you can understand the same thing at the same time. Um, maximum flows. Those may not actually control the failure or the erodibility. If you get thicker flows, you might actually have, you might wash out some of the some of the agitation and some of the uh, angry water that can happen at lower flows. Difference between erosion, a uniform material, and a spatially complex discontinuous geology. Gotcha, I'm done. Um, spour spring power, yep, you can read all that. Probably said most of it one way or the other. Oh man, I forgot about, this is a fun one. 
This is the fun part. Okay, gut check. I've got six rock masses looking here, and I named them. So anyone can name like the least erodible rock. What would you say is the least erodible one? Yay, what's the most erodible one? Yeah, and then anybody know where I got those names from? No? Oh man, Letter Kenny, it's a TV show. <laughs> uh, this was another knowledge check. I think I'll skip this. This was, um, I think we were talking about Wapapello at some point, but this would be the information that you would need to bring into the risk assessment. You'd wanna have understanding of this stuff before, before you go in there. Key takeaways, I know I'm at zero, but I got, I got, Side swiped at the beginning. <laughs> okay, understand the spatial relationship of the foundation and erosion potential uh, relative to the flow hydraulic slope geometry, the structure, um, the physics, and the geology. You've got to consider the whole system structure, foundation, driving forces, all as a system. Um, consider the three dimensionality aspect in a risk assessment. Structural foundation stability, spillway risk characterization is complex, multidisciplinary. Um, know as much as you can about how the other disciplines view and characterize and understand uh, the mechanics. Uh, learn some of the case histories for structural failures as well as um, spillway failures. Modeling and analysis informs our risk characterization. It's a tool, and then we got to add judgment onto the results from models because all models are wrong and some are useful, um, and be prepared with an understanding of the site characterization and the conditions before you go into the risk assessment. We can do stuff after if it's decided that that's important, but um, for the most part, we, we wanna try to do all this ahead of time. All right, well, that's it.